So I'm, I'm Ben, by the way. And I'm Homaro. And we're chefs. So when Moda opened in 2004, people didn't really know what to expect. A lot of people thought that it was a Japanese restaurant, and maybe it was the name, uh, maybe it was the logo, it was just like a Japanese character. Uh, but anyway, we had all these requests for Japanese food, which is really not what we did. And after about the 10,000th request for a maki roll, uh, we decided to give the people what they wanted. So this picture is an example of printed food, and this was the first foray into what we like to call flavor transformation. So this is all the ingredients, all the flavor of, you know, a standard maki roll printed onto a little piece of paper. So our diners started getting bored with this idea, and uh, we decided to give them the same course twice. So here we actually took a, an element from the maki roll and took a picture of a dish and then basically served that picture with the dish. So this dish in particular is basically champagne with seafood. The champagne grapes that you see are actually carbonated grapes. A little bit of seafood and some creme fraiche, and the picture actually tastes exactly like the dish. But it, it's, it's not all just edible pictures. We decided to do something a little bit different and transform flavors that were very familiar. So in this case, uh, we have carrot cake. So we take a carrot cake, put it in a blender, and we have kind of like a carrot cake juice. And then that went into a balloon frozen in liquid nitrogen to create this uh, hollow shell of carrot cake ice cream, I guess. And it comes off looking like, you know, Jupiter's floating around your plate. So yeah, transforming things into something that you have absolutely no reference for. And here's something we have no reference to eat. Uh, this is a cigar, and basically it's a Cuban cigar made out of a Cuban pork sandwich. So we take the spices that go into the pork shoulder, we fashion that into ash. We take the sandwich and wrap it up in a collard green, put an edible label that bears no similarity to a Cohiba cigar label, and we put it in a $1.99 ashtray and charge you about 20 bucks for it. <laughs> Delicious. That's not it, though. Instead of making foods that look like things that you wouldn't eat, uh, we decided to make ingredients look like dishes that you know. So this is a plate of nachos. Uh, the difference between our nachos and like, the other guy's nachos is that this is actually a dessert. So the chips are candied, the, uh, the ground beef is made from chocolate, and the cheese is made from a shredded mango sorbet that gets shredded into liquid nitrogen to look like cheese. And uh, after you know, doing all this like, dematerialization and like, reconfiguring of, this, of these ingredients, uh, we realized it was pretty cool because as we served it, we learned that the dish actually behaves uh, like the real thing, where the cheese begins to melt. So when you're looking at this thing in the dining room, you have the sensation that this is actually a plate of nachos. Um, and it's not really until you begin tasting it that you realize this is a dessert, and it's just kind of like a mind, a mind ripper. <laughs> so we had been creating all of these dishes out of a, a kitchen that was more like a mechanic shop than a kitchen. And uh, the next logical step for us was to install a state-of-the-art laboratory. And that's what we have here. So we put this in the basement, and we got really serious about food, like serious experimentation. One of the really cool things about the lab, besides that we have a new science lab in the kitchen, is that uh, you know, with this new equipment and, these, and this new approach, uh, all these different doors to creativity that we never knew were there began to open. And so the, the experiments and the, the food and the, the dishes that we created, they just kept going further and further out there. Let's talk about flavor transformation, and let's actually make some cool stuff. You see a cow with its tongue hanging out. What I see is a cow about to eat something delicious. What is that cow eating, and why is it delicious? So the cow basically eats three basic things in their feed, corn, beets, and barley. And so what I do is I actually challenge my staff with these crazy wild ideas. Can we take what the cow eats, remove the cow, and then make some hamburgers out of that? And uh, basically the reaction tends to be kind of like this. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's our chef de cuisine, Chris Jones. This is not the only guy that just flips out when we assign a ridiculous task. But uh, a lot of these ideas, they're, they're hard to understand. They're, they're hard to just get automatically. Uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of, uh, a lot of failure, uh, trial and error, I guess, more error, 
that goes into each and every dish. So we don't always get it right, and it, it takes a while for us to be able to explain that to people. So after about a day of Chris and I staring at each other, uh, we came up with something that was pretty close to the hamburger patty. And uh, as you can see, it basically forms like hamburger meat. This is made from three ingredients, beets, barley, corn. And so it actually cooks up like hamburger meat, looks and tastes like hamburger meat. And not only that, but uh, it's basically removing the cow from the equation. So replicating food, taking it into that next level is where we're going. Word. And it's definitely the world's first bleeding veggie burger, mm. which was a cool yeah. side effect. And uh, a miracle berry, if you're not familiar with it, is a natural ingredient, and it contains a special property. It's a glycoprotein called miraculin, a naturally occurring thing. It still freaks me out every time I eat it but it has a, a unique ability to mask certain taste receptors on your tongue, so that uh, primarily sour taste receptors. So normally things that would taste very sour or tart uh, somehow begin to taste very sweet. You're about to eat a lemon, and now it tastes like lemonade. Let's just stop and think about the economic benefits of something like that. We could eliminate sugar across the board for all confectionery products and sodas, and we can replace it with all natural fresh fruit. Uh, so you see us here cutting up some watermelon. The idea with this is that we're going to eliminate uh, tons of food miles, um, you know, just like wasted energy and overfishing of tuna by creating tuna um, or any exotic produce or, or, um, or item from a very far away place with local organic produce. So we have a, a watermelon from uh, Wisconsin. So if Miracle Berries take sour things and turn them into sweet things, we have this other pixie dust that we put on the watermelon, and it makes it go from sweet to savory. So after we do that, we put it into a vacuum bag, add a little bit of seaweed, some spices, we roll it, and this starts taking on the appearance of tuna. So the key now is to make it behave like tuna. And then after a quick dip into some liquid nitrogen to get that perfect sear, um, we really have something that looks, tastes, and behaves like, uh, like the real thing. So the key thing to remember here is we don't really care what this tuna really is. As long as it's good for you and good for the environment, it doesn't matter. But where is this going? How can we take this idea of tricking your taste buds and leapfrog it into something that we can do today that could be a disruptive food technology? So here's the next challenge. I told the staff, let's just take a bunch of wild plants, think of them as food ingredients, as long as they're non-poisonous to the human body, go out around Chicago, sidewalks, pick it, blend it, cook it, and then have everybody flavor trip on it at Moto. Let's charge them a boatload of cash for this and see what they think. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine uh, a task like this. This is another one of those assignments that the kitchen staff hated us for, but we really had to almost like relearn how to, how to cook in general. Because uh, these are ingredients, you know, plant life that we're, one, unfamiliar with, and two, we have no reference for how to cook these things because people don't eat them. Um, so we really had to like think about new creative ways to flavor, uh, new ways to cook and to change, change texture. And that was the main issue with this challenge. So this is where we step into the future um, and we leapfrog ahead. So developing nations and first world nations, imagine if you could take these wild plants and consume them, uh, food miles would basically turn into food feet. This disruptive mentality of what food is would essentially open up the encyclopedia of what raw ingredients are. Even if we just swapped out, say, one of these for like flour, that would eliminate so much energy and so much waste. And uh, to give you a simple example here as to what we actually fed these customers, there's a bale of hay there and some crab apples. And basically we took hay and crab apples and made barbecue sauce out of those two ingredients. People swore they were eating barbecue sauce, and this is free food. Thanks, guys. <laughs>